from the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. At first glance, the small West African nation of Equatorial Guinea is doing well. Sandwiched between Cameroon and Gabon on the Gulf of Guinea, the oil-rich nation of 820,000 has a per capita GDP equivalent to that of the Czech Republic or Portugal. But the picture is more complicated than that. Much of its population lives in conditions similar to that in the world's poorest countries. Infant mortality rates are worse than in Ethiopia or war-ravaged South Sudan. Many people lack access to clean drinking water, and about half the population lives in poverty. A large chunk of Equatorial Guinea's oil revenues are thought to have been lost to corruption. All this has taken place under the watch of President Teodoro Obiang, who's been in charge since 1979, when he ousted his own uncle in a military coup. From the capital, Malabo, Obiang has ruled with an iron fist as his son, the country's second vice president, has made headlines around the world for lavish spending on a fleet of Ferraris and Bentleys, mansions in Malibu and Paris, and for acquiring perhaps the world's greatest collection of Michael Jackson memorabilia. When it comes to media, Equatorial Guinea ranks near the bottom of Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index, grouped in with countries like China, Somalia, and Iran. All broadcast media in the country is controlled by the government, and there is virtually no private press. Despite these accusations, Obiang has had little opposition within the country during his 36 years as president. He was even quoted once as saying, what right does the opposition have to criticize the actions of a government? On this edition of Global Journalist, a look at the future of this small nation and the challenges it faces as its oil revenues begin to join up. Dry up. Joining us this week from Washington, D.C., Tutu Alicante, Executive Director of Equatorial Guinea Justice, a human rights group. From Berkeley, California, Tawanda Kanema. He's the producer of the 2014 documentary, The Prince of Malabo, Power, Money, and Impunity, which examines corruption in the country. He's also a producer for Al Jazeera's digital news platform, AJ+. Plus. And from London, Oscar Scafidi, a travel writer who's the author of the upcoming Grad Guide to Equatorial Guinea and a business risk consultant on Africa. Tutu Alicante, you yourself are in exile from Equatorial Guinea. Give us just a brief history of how President Obiang uh, came to power and the trajectory of his rule in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me in this program. Um, I think the American people have to know more about Equatorial Guinea, a country that up until 1968 uh, was under the uh, uh, arms, I guess, under the, the control of Spain as a Spanish colony. But we gained independence in 68, and from 68 to 79, we had one of the worst regimes, and that was uh, the regime of Francisco Macias, uncle of President Obiang. Obiang has taken over since, and some minor progress uh, has happened, but overall, overall, the situation of poverty, the, the, the conditions that affect most of the people in that country have not changed significantly. And what about, I understand oh, there was the oil discovery in the mid-1990s. How did that change Equatorial Guinea? Equatorial Guinea in the mid-1990s went from being an isolated, poor, uh, repressive nation to still a repressive, isolated, but now no longer poor, filthy rich. You know, as you mentioned in your introduction, we have a GDP per capita. I mean, we have the highest GDP per capita in Africa, right? Thank to, thanks to the oil discovery, oil and gas, right? But when you look at the uh, Human Development Index, we still right at the bottom, right there with uh, South Sudan, with Haiti, with the DRC Congo. Oscar Scafidi, you're a travel journalist. You've lived in West Africa, different parts of Africa. What is striking to the foreign traveler about Equatorial Guinea? Do you, do you see the effects of this oil boom as you travel around there? Uh, yeah, I think it's very hard not to. I think it's uh, quite incredible traveling around Malabo and also just to the northeast in Sapopo, the business district. Uh, you see the, the level of investment that has gone into the new infrastructure projects. Um, and traveling around the mainland as well. I mean, everywhere you go, you see large, brand new roads and, and a lot of sort of urbanization product, projects. Uh, one of the flagships being the brand new capital city of Ayala in the center of Rio Muni. And Tawanda Kanema, you made a documentary about the president's son, Teodoro Nguema Obiang. Uh, he's now the second vice president of the country. He used to be the minister of agriculture. Why were you so interested in him? How did you get interested in the story of Equatorial Guinea? 
Well, the story begins, for me, the story begins in 2004 when a group of mercenaries was arrested at the airport in Zimbabwe, in Harare, on their way to overthrow the government of President Obiang. Uh, so once I got to California and uh, discovered that there was a case in the U.S. District Court in Los Angeles alleging that Mr. Obiang had laundered at least $72 million into the United States uh, through 29 bank accounts held in California, I became interested in uh, retracing that story and really finding out what was going on. I wanted to get Mr. Obiang's side of the story, and that's what led me to Malabo, and that's what led me to make this documentary. And Tutu Alicante, on the operational level, give us a sense within Equatorial. Can you, we just heard Tawanda Kanema talking about 70 some million dollars potentially being laundered into the U.S. Who actually controls the oil revenues within the country? You know, I've seen it reported there are about two or three billion dollars coming to the country each year just from oil. How much of that money is actually spent on the country's infrastructure? Oscar Scafidi was just saying there's some really spectacular projects, infrastructure projects happening in the country. How much of it is disappearing elsewhere? Do we have a good sense of that? Well, Equatorial Guinea really is ran as a mafia, right? As a mafia where uh, one family controls absolutely everything. Uh, President Obiang has been quoted or saying, you know, the uh, resources of the country or the revenues of this of, of the oil in this country are a state secret, right? A state secret that only he and members of his family know about. As you mentioned, one of his sons, the one involved in the cases uh, that uh, Tawanda has documented uh, wonderfully, um, was a minister of agriculture and right now holds a position that does not uh, board with the constitution, the second vice president, right? The other son, who is the minister of mine, controls basically everything that has to do with the mining industry. And then, and, and just like that, you know, he has either his sons or his cousins or nephews in all key positions, Ministry of Economy, etc., etc. So it's, it's next to impossible for a lay person like myself to tell you how much money is disappearing in that country, right? We know how much uh, the U.S. Senate uh, has documented that appear in the Riggs Bank. We know how much money is now involved in a case. Riggs Bank in was France. a bank in Washington, D.C. that collapsed after it was accused of money laundering for the Equatorial e Guinean government. Is that right? Exactly. We have an ongoing case in Spain uh, where recently the Kokore, the Russian couple, they were acting as middlemen for President Obiang's family, has been arrested. And we know how much money is involved in those cases. But what we don't know, the unknown unknown here, you know, is how much money is disappearing elsewhere. You know, how much money is Gabriel and his many companies laundering through um, banks and, and companies in London, in South Africa, and in many other places. You know? So the unknown unknown here is more terrifying than what we naturally know. Oscar Scafidi, you, you traveled to Equatorial Guinea, did extensive research there when writing the travel guide. Do ordinary Equatorial Guineans, do they have a sense of some of the corruption allegations against their leaders and sort of what's their, what's their take on that? Well, I think, uh, as you commented on earlier on, there's very restricted access to, to, to the sort of free media in the country. So not the sort of access that we have here. But uh, at the same time, yeah, I mean, people, people are able to access social media. They are able to see these accusations. And it's, it's not really a, a topic of conversation, uh, an open topic of conversation with outsiders. But it's certainly something that everyone's aware of, I think. And many countries with really high levels of inequality um, around the world. You see high levels of crime, violence, civil conflict. Is that something that you see in Equatorial Guinea? Um, it's not something that I saw in Equatorial Guinea uh, in terms of the crime. In fact, I found I found a lot of the places that I went to to be uh, some of the safest in that part of Africa. So, so no, I don't think I don't think there's a there's a serious crime problem uh, in the traditional sense somewhere like Malabo or Bata. Um, I don't know if the other guests would agree with that. So I, I, I actually agree, you know, that Equatorial Guinea is a relatively safe place, right? The violence that you see in many other places in Africa, you do not see there. Um, however, internet penetrability in Equatorial Guinea is very low, about 4%. And uh, Facebook is blocked in Equatorial Guinea. There is no Twitter in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, several websites, 
several websites, including websites of the opposition political parties inside the country, have been blocked by the government, right? So uh, do many people know about corruption and the level, the extent of corruption that exists in Equatorial Guinea? The answer is actually no. This Not is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. This week, a look at the tiny nation of Equatorial Guinea and how corruption and media crackdowns have been the norm for the past four decades. Our guest this week from Washington, D.C., Tutu Alicante, Executive Director for Equatorial Guinea Justice, a human rights group, from Berkeley, California, Tawanda Kanema, producer of the documentary The Prince of Malabo, Power, Money, and Impunity, which looks at corruption in Equatorial Guinea, and from London, Oscar Scafidi, author of the new Brat Guide to Equatorial Guinea, a travel journalist who specializes in writing about difficult places to visit. A reminder that if you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Tawanda Kanema, you, you had mentioned briefly that the U.S. Department of Justice had been bringing uh, a case against Equatorial Guinea. That case has been settled. President Obiang's government has also faced uh, some legal prosecution in France and elsewhere in Europe. Give us just an overview as to where the state of play is with those corruption investigations by foreign authorities and what's likely to happen next. Right now we know that you know, there were assets acquired across at least five countries. So we were looking at the United States, we're looking at France, we're looking at uh, Spain, we're looking at Brazil and South Africa. And uh, at least, I know at least one case in those uh, five countries is still active. The case that was brought by the French government uh, over a $120 million mansion that Mr. Obiang bought in Paris. And, this is the uh, younger Obiang, the vice president. Yes, this is the younger Obiang. So the French government officially indicted Mr. Obiang over the purchase of the $120 million mansion that, that is in Paris. And um, the 11 sports cars that were seized from his properties in Paris and, had, and millions of dollars worth of assets also in Paris. So that case is still open. And um, the U.S. case, meanwhile, they have come into a settlement where Mr. Obiang was asked to pay $16 million, which is supposed to go towards a charity that benefits the citizens of Equatorial Guinea. And um, we also had documented the purchase of the $38 million private jet, uh, but that, that asset was removed from the United States, and so they were not able to pursue it. Uh, so we're still looking at uh, cases that have been brought in, in Brazil, um, where Mr. Obiang also acquired a mansion, and uh, nothing has been brought on the case in, in South Africa, where there are two other properties there. So right now we're still looking at the property in France, uh, for which there's an ongoing case. Well, let me let me ask you about Equatorial Guinea's relations with the United States, with other Western countries, Tawanda. And I want to read a quote to you that came from the settlement agreement with the U.S. Justice Department. Um, and this is, this is from Assistant Attorney General uh, Leslie Caldwell. Through relentless embezzlement and extortion, Vice President Nguema Obiang shamelessly looted his government and shook down businesses in his country to support his lavish lifestyle, while many of his fellow citizens lived in extreme poverty. After raking in millions in bribes and kickbacks, Nguema Obiang embarked on a corruption-fueled spending spree in the United States. And so I guess my question is, if, if this is such a bad government, how is it that the president, Nguema Obiang's father, comes to be photographed at the White House repeatedly with President Obama with the First Lady? Well, this is the paradox of international politics, where you have the relationship of a government to its citizens is different from the relationship of a government to other governments and uh, you know its position in the international community. So you see gross human rights abuses and pilfering, looting of the national treasury at home, and you see sort of this acceptance and couching and um, we, in international politics, I think there is more done to protect and reward the perpetrators of financial crimes than is done to actually protect the victims. 
uh, you find that Mr. Obiang, being vice president, now enjoys diplomatic immunity and can claim di diplomatic immunity as a head of state. Um, so the relationship of the Equatorial Guinea to the United States, I think, is more predicated on its position as the third largest producer of oil in sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, there's really strong lobbying in D.C. by oil companies and their representatives to sort of uh, whitewash this government's image and uh, put it in good books with, 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 with Washington and other, and other global capitals. Uh, and you have, on the other on the other hand, you Oscar Scafidi. Uh, I'm sorry that we lost Tawanda there on the audio briefly. You you were in Equatorial Guinea brief uh, recently. Give us just a sense of what role foreign foreigners and foreign investment plays in the economy. I understand that Marathon Oil and Exxon Mobil have been there for some time. The Chinese have increased their presence in Equatorial Guinea. What what role do they play? Well, I mean, they, they play a huge role. The economy is entirely dependent upon upon oil, oil and gas. So I think over 90 percent of Equatorial Guinea's foreign export earnings are based around the hydrocarbon sector. So essentially, the, the only productive part of the economy um, in the international sense is the interaction that Equatorial Guinea has with these companies from China or the West uh, exporting their natural resources. And Tutu Alicante, Tawanda Kanema, before he was cut off, he was talking about the lobbying efforts by the government of Equatorial yes. Guinea in Washington uh, to effectively put pressure on the U.S. government. Um, we do know that Lanny Davis, uh, Bill Clinton's former legal advisor, has been a registered lobbyist uh, for Equatorial Guinea. I believe the chief of staff to former Senator Roy, uh, to Senator Roy Blunt, the former chief of staff, was a lobbyist for Equatorial Guinea. They've hired a number of big PR firms, including Corvus. How effective have they been at getting their message out? Well, I think, and in, in related to the question that you have for Tawanda, um, just on Monday, there was a picture of President Obama, or I guess the presidential family, Obama and Michelle, uh, and uh, Theodorin, the son of President Obiang, who is not the head of state, and who you read uh, uh, the words from the Department of Justice's press release, you know, when that case settled, right? So how is it that someone whose asset has been seized in the United States, who we know have been embezzling money from that country and laundering through U.S. banks, gets to take a pay, and who is holding, by the way, a non-constitutional position in, because there is no such thing in Equatorial Guinea's constitution as the second vice president, right? So this is an unconstitutional person uh, who is only there because he's the son of the president. How is it? How do, how do we justify the picture between Theodorine and the uh, uh, the Obamas, right? And clearly, is is it has to be attributed to the oil companies and to the incredible work that these lobbying companies or these uh, PR firms are doing uh, thanks to the millions of dollars that, you know, instead of helping citizens in the country, instead of going to address the basic needs uh, in healthcare, in education, are being siphoned out here to, to lobbying firms who are helping to launder that money by their actions. Tawanda Kanema, your take on this, how effective has Equatorial Guinea been in getting its message forward uh, through lobbying in Washington, D.C.? I would say very effective. Uh, lobbying has really, really done a good job of trying to whitewash, you know, the government's, uh, the government's image. And um, it's, it's, it's the reason, you know, we stumbled upon one of uh, Mr. Obiang's uh, public one of Mr. Obiang's uh, image management agencies, um, you know, they, they have this basically a pipeline where they bring in uh, photographers into the country to um, document Mr. Obiang donating to schools and uh, doing these supposedly charitable activities. And this in turn helps to counterbalance the reporting about the human rights situation in the country and the corruption in the country. So I think lobbying firms have done a lot to try and present uh, this regime in positive light. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're looking at Equatorial Guinea and how a tiny country is causing big problems for its people. Joining us this week from Washington, D.C., Tutu Alicante, 
Executive Director for Equatorial Guinea Justice, a human rights group. From Berkeley, California, Tawanda Kanema, producer of the documentary The Prince of Malibu, Power, Money, and Impunity. And from London, Oscar Scafidi, a business risk consultant and travel writer who is author of the new Brad Guide to Equatorial Guinea. Oscar Scafidi, one challenge for Equatorial Guinea is that oil revenues are declining and its population has been growing very rapidly, almost 3%. A lot of those people live in Malibu and on islands uh, in the Gulf of Guinea. What's the economic outlook for this country? Well, I suppose that depends who you ask. Uh, the official plan is to try and diversify the economy away from oil dependence. And they've got this plan called the Horizon 2020 Development Plan. And I think that the plan is basically to diversify into five different areas, one of them being tourism. Um, uh, I'm not sure how that's going, to be honest. Um, and with the global downturn in oil prices, that's made the situation for the government even more difficult because they don't have that oil revenue to invest in trying to diversify things. And what about other parts of the economy then? Is, it, is there still substantial agriculture in Equatorial Guinea? I know at one time it was a coffee producer, it was a cocoa producer. Do those parts of the economy, have they thrived during the oil period or have they, have they withered? Uh, well, they've withered. So we, we talk about Dutch disease, so the, the effect of oil and its negative impacts on the rest of the economy. So the majority of Equatorial Guinea citizens are engaged in subsistence farming. Um, I mean, there is still some cocoa being produced, but certainly not at sort of export levels and certainly not enough to make a large dent in the uh, export revenues. Tutu Alicante, President Obiang has been in power now for 36 years. His son seems to be in line to be his successor, obviously someone who has been quite controversial, got quite a lot of negative attention around the world. What do you envision a potential transition, political transition, looking like there? Sadly, Equatorial Guinea has become a case in which it is hard to imagine a peaceful political transition happening there. Right? I think the uh, current government has ensured that uh, there are no institutions that could guarantee that type of peaceful transfer of power. The uh, parliament is a complete joke. There is no judiciary system. Political parties the, uh, inside the country, there is only one meaningful political opposition party, which is very, very weak and dependent on the same government that's supposed to be running against. So it's, it's next to impossible to imagine a peaceful transition of power in Equatorial Guinea. Um, in my opinion, the only way you get transfer of power from these kleptocrats that have been holding on to power for the last 36 years is uh, when you have the involvement of the international community, uh, the African Union, members of uh, um, the CEMAC, the uh, regional uh, uh, government institutions, you know, from from Central Africa, involved in fostering a democratic transition. Other than that, you know, it's, it's difficult. Either that or the alternative, you know, which for me, you know, is uh, citizens rising up and demanding some changes, as it has happened recently in Burkina Faso and in other places, so in, in Senegal, to cite a, a perfectly uh, good example. Tawanda Kanema, you know, we've heard about many of the problems in Equatorial Guinea. How is it that the country has remained so peaceful and how is it that the government has been able to maintain control for this long given the amount of money coming into the country and given uh, sort of the, po the widespread poverty that exists there? I think that's partially because of, you know, the country's uh, geographic location. They say geography is destiny and I think um, for, for regime longevity, uh, geography can also be destiny. The Equatorial Guinea is quite isolated um, in terms of, you know, being the only former Spanish colony in the region. So they don't benefit from um, sort of the media chatter that um, would normally would normally help sensitize citizens to what's happening inside their country, you know, by virtue of receiving uh, media from your, your neighboring countries like we've seen in the region. Uh, so Equatorial Guinea is quite isolated politically um, and uh, I think it's been a blessing for the capital to be located on an island that's really difficult to access from, from the mainland. So um, that could be an element uh, of why the regime has managed to be so successful at uh, maintaining its grip on power. But the other thing is also just the repression, just, you know, the, the, the clamp down on 
free speech on the press and on the political opposition. So that tends to, you know, keep dissent down, um, very strong monitoring and surveillance of the, the opposition of journalists. Just a week before we got into the country, two reporters from the Financial Times were arrested and, you know, they, all of their equipment seized and they were detained for seven hours uh, simply for interviewing uh, people that had not been cleared by the government to have all And Tawanda Kanema, it looks like we've lost you again. Oscar Scafidi, you heard Tutu Alicante talking about what a potential transition might look like in Equatorial Guinea. What is your sense of as to how that might go and what role is there for the international community, for other African leaders to play a role in that? Well, I think the, uh, the, the generally accepted view is that Teodoran will take over. Um, although there is, there are some questions around uh, one of Obiang's other sons, Gabriel, uh, perhaps also, also aiming for the top position. Um, but that's he's sort of a, an outside runner, as it were. Uh, in terms of, in terms of the role of the international community, I think, to be honest, uh, it will be quite limited. Um, from the point of view of America and the West, their main interest will be to keep it peaceful as peaceful as possible, or at least as, uh, peaceful enough to not interfere uh, with their economic activities in the country, mainly being the export of oil. And Tutu Alicante, how transparent is this regime? How easy is it to get access to them, to have dialogue with them? Uh, your group is obviously a human rights group, has been very critical. But do we see the president, do we see other government officials giving interviews to journalists when they're outside the country, when they travel to the United Nations, to other African capitals? So it depends on you know the journalists and it depends on you know whether these journalists have been cleared by uh, the PR firms. I mean, uh, to give you an example, there is a video out there of uh, the president naming me as a trader of the nation, right? And more people like myself, you know, do have basically no access. Um, any human rights activist, any journalist that has ever published anything critical of the regime has no access, right? And we have asked for interviews with the president and members of the cabinet when they are here in Washington, D.C., and, you know, we have zero access. However, if you're trying to invest in the country or if you're trying to help produce a PR video that then they can showcase uh, with uh, what's going on inside the country, you know, then, yes, you, you can have access. That'll do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Many thanks to Tutu Alicante, Tawanda Kanema, and Oscar Scafidi for coming on the program. Global Journalist executive producer is Josh Kranzberg. Our associate producers this week are Javila raskas Kate, Eleni Akaya, Ju Hyun Lee, Zhu Hang, and Erjun Peng. Our studio director is Travis McMillan from RJI, and our audio engineer is Pat Akers of KBIA. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.